We find ourselves at 6.30. And so let us begin with prayer. Lord of the church, you have clearly told us that our mission is to save souls through the preaching of the gospel. You have revealed to us that your word alone gives us salvation through faith. Strengthen our faith in your word. Strengthen our commitment to use your word to fulfill our mission in the church. Spare us from the harm that inevitably comes to the church's mission and the souls of its people when the church relies on governments, rulers, and laws to accomplish what the gospel alone can accomplish. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd like to turn to page 19 in our booklet, and we find ourselves beginning the section titled, The Separation of Church and State. God's purposes are best served when the church and the state remain separate. The church should not interfere with the state, nor should the state interfere with the church. When the church tries to function as the state, it forsakes the gospel in favor of the sword. When the state tries to function as a church, it uses the sword to do what only the gospel can accomplish. Christians in our culture who are active in the political world have to be especially careful to remember this. So let's take a look at God's word. Would someone like to read that Proverbs 28, 2 through 12 passage? Carolyn. So as we consider those words that were just read, do you see any traits of a bad government and traits of a good government? Or what traits of a bad government and what traits of a good government do you see there in those words? Evan. So a lack of justice on the part of a bad government in that regard. What else do we see there? Dave. Yeah, you, you notice it in that second verse on... Good ruler, good leader is going to provide that stability. And that stability is going to come in that integrity, that, that maintaining justice. Another way of speaking of integrity is that idea of a, of a justness when it comes to that integrity. 
What else do we maybe see? Good government. Jeff, bad government. Bad government oppresses the poor. Yeah, an oppression of the poor, um, taking advantage of those for the betterment of themselves rather than taking care of those who are in need of being taken care of. In a way, you could kind of see the flip side of that in the good government in offering protection, and especially to those who can't provide it and protect themselves. Evan? Yeah, that opposite of the integrity, the hypocritical. Um, Jeff? The good government will um, uphold the law. Yeah, Um, a lawfulness, a justice um, that isn't taking place in the in the bad government. So you, you, you see here, um, even in the book of Proverbs, those wise sayings, as, as the Lord lays out here, um, he lays out these differences between what we will see in the good governments, what we will see in the, in the bad governments. I'm turning the page to question two then. The state operates by means of natural law and human reason, but the difference between good and bad governments generally involves more than a lack of wisdom or common sense among its leaders. When do rulers and governments generally go rogue. What could you say is maybe a bit of an overarching thought or mindset that happens when they go rogue? And in that ruling by fear, what is the goal? Power. And thus... Providing, satisfying, serving only whom? Exactly. In general, as we look throughout the history of the world, as you consider that section of the Proverbs passages that you were looking at, um, we see that in general we see those governments go rogue when it becomes a matter of only serving self. Um, Any examples? Evan. Evan. So we've, and we've got the example then with Stalin, right? Um, Joseph Stalin pulling that power to himself. What else in history? Now well, we can see it in, in things such as Hitler um, serving self. Napoleon, and is, go ahead, Rudy. Well, we just talked about one person, Hammond Hochef, uh, Bush Farrell, during the Exodus. Sure. Um, and in that regard, too, you could kind of say, um, we don't know exactly the way he was taking care of his people, the Egyptians, but certainly it was an oppression on the part of the Israelites just for the sake of um, the Egyptian nation rather than for the entire nation that was, was under him. Um, and isn't that sometimes one of, the, one of the fears and concerns as we look at our political world today too, right? Um, is are we, do we at times find or are we sometimes skeptical and, and not wrongfully so, um, we will continue to let uh, things play out because finally um, we'll see what the Lord has in store for us. 
But isn't there sometimes dangers? Isn't that sometimes one of the things that, that leads us in the way in which we, we seek to vote? Is, is, is this a case of individuals who are looking for the good of the people? Or is this a case of people looking for the good of their own pocketbooks, the good of their own political parties at the expense of the nation that we, we hope they will rule rather than for the benefit of the nation that they rule? Um, you know, we can see it throughout, throughout history. Um, question three, unfortunately, Governments acting in the name of religion can be just as corrupt and misguided. They often persecute those who obey the Lord. Give examples. Jeff? Islam. Yeah. Um, Islamic government leaders um, that will persecute Christianity in their midst. Pastor? Yeah, I'm um, certainly during the Middle Ages there when you had the Emperor Charles and, and the Pope um, using military force to enforce doctrine, right? Into the Papal States and everything else. Evan? All right. Um, and we maybe don't see it quite as much um, with the Roman rule as much during the time of, of, of Caiaphas, but we certainly see it in the aspect of that they were complicit with the Jewish leadership in enforcing the um, persecution upon the Christians. Rudy? Sure. Um, if you think about it, we even have, it, have the case in, in our own United States. Um, early, very early on, um, the Mormons were extraordinarily persecuted. Um, and, you know, it's, it's one of those aspects of when we, we consider freedom of religion and the blessings of the freedom of religion is ultimately um, a good government's going to offer protection to all regardless of, of what, it, what it was. Um, but if you ever do a little bit of a history on the, on the Mormons, you know, they continued to move west because of the persecution they faced in the east. Um, and then, too, in the 1800s of Germany, um, if you've ever heard the Prussian Union, um, there was a case of where the government came in and basically was forcing the, the Lutherans to, to compromise their positions on scripture, um, and in a, if I'm not mistaken, it is, it is about that time that the practice of kneeling at communion began. It was a way in which it, they gave a bit of a, a definitiveness because um, the Calvinists did not believe and do not believe that the body and blood of Christ are present with the bread and wine, um, and because of this wanted force union, um, they Lutherans begin, began to kneel as a way to profess we believe the body and blood are present together with the bread and the wine. Crusades. Crusades would be one, absolutely. Um, as you see, the government seeking to um, enforce their religion by means of force. Um, so much so that it, you, you hear the story is that it was a case of um, sword to the throat deny what it is that you believe and confess Christ. If not, through the, through the throat goes the, the sword. Pastor. Yeah. And, you know, you, you see another example of the, the problems that state-run churches cause? Um, are people joining the church because it's the truth that they believe, or they join it for the economic benefits that come along with it? Um, we take a look here then at this good government, bad government, the ones that have, have at times just gone rogue, and those that at times have, have wanted to try and, and do the work of the church, and yet we recognize our Lord and Savior says there is supposed to be a separation 
between the two. Um, would someone like to read Matthew 22, 15 through 22, as we see Jesus teach that very truth? Penny. So this question four says that that coin would have had Caesar's inscription on it and an inscription that would have said um, Caesar was a god. How did the enemies of Jesus plan to trap him with their question? So if he, if he were to say, pay taxes, and that's it, what would they have come back and said? And if he had said no, um, what would they have said? It's, it's, kind of, it's, a, it's a trick question, it's a trap question, as we see from Scripture, but it's, but it's kind of like if somebody were to come up to you and say, so have you stopped stealing from your employer? If you answer yes, it means that you had been. If you answer no, it means that you are. Either way, you're, you're in trouble. So, so, so how is... Um, how are they planning to trap him? If, if, he said, if he comes to them and says, okay, pay, yes, pay your taxes, and, and, and that's it, then it was going to be a matter of them saying, well, you're giving in to this whole idea of treating Caesar like a god, and you're breaking the first commandment. If he had said no, then they would have taken him to the authorities and said, he's refusing to pay taxes. That's ultimately what they were seeking to do. Um, but it couldn't be answered with simple yes or no. Just like you can't answer, have you stopped stealing from your employer with just a yes or a no? How come Jesus, or why was Jesus' answer absolutely perfect? Besides the fact that he's true God. Rudy. Satisfies both sides without pitting one against the other. Take note of that, right? Isn't that so much what's going on in the conversations that people have today when it comes to political things? And absolutely pitting one against something of the other without there ever being the possibility of something gray in the middle. Um, Jesus gives a perfect answer because he doesn't pit the one against the other and he speaks to the one separate in the sense of the way God speaks to the one and he speaks to the other separate in the way that God speaks to the other because in many respects they're not having things to do with each other in specific cases. Now, ultimately, as a Christian, they do have things to do with each other because, as the next question says, what do we owe to God and to those who govern us? So take the, take the first part. What do we owe to God? And never a case of ignoring, just give an opportunity for the, the slower um, forming Thoughts to come. Mark. Everything, including obedience and honor 
and respect to the government. That's really a key in answering that question, isn't it? Um, Obedience to that government, except when the government comes and tells us to go against God's word, is part of our thankful response to God. And then we owe that respect and that obedience to the government. What danger exists when people don't recognize the separation of church and state or confuse the distinction between the two? What danger exists? Penny. And I, th- I think you meant to say state, the government. You said the church. But um, I, I knew what you were saying. But yes, the, the state would tell people what they need to worship. Um, correct. And, and if, if there isn't that proper separation, the, the state can try to do the work that the church does. And what can easily happen is people can start looking to the state to do what the church is supposed to do. I th- did I take what you said, Pastor? Well, I was just going to say that the, the state coming in and telling you uh, you need to marry and all that, like that. Yeah. Evan. So you're, you're thinking in the sense of the church trying to act like the state and create a, a, a utopic type of, of society by forcing everyone to follow that, that one religion. Yeah. Uh, and think about this too, is that if the church, and of course it doesn't become a case of where the church has to try and do the work of the state, but there can become a lack of separation if the church gets so caught up in political matters and political affairs that they begin to push one political agenda. And if that church continues to just push one political agenda, um, what would happen to the individual who might visit the congregation who looks at things from a politically different point of view. What are they going to do? This isn't the church for me because they're not going to welcome me and my views. Um, And notice how then, if the church gets caught up in that, it completely loses its mission as well as even turns individuals away. We, we do need to be careful in our political rhetoric in which we speak as, as we gather together to make sure that we aren't taking that rhetoric and making others feel as if they aren't welcome because of it. Um, we'll kind of come to some of those questions as we, as we come up. Um, you know, should, a, should a, a church be pointing out the evils in society? The answer is absolutely yes. The key, though, is how does one do it? Is it by sitting and standing up in a pulpit and talking about the political individuals who are taking everything this direction? Or is it by a case of proclaiming the truth of God's word, which sheds light on the evils that are being done as people connect the dots to see, hey, this isn't according to God's word. 
The key is how it's done. Yes, Rudy. I don't know that I'm going to um, be able to answer it in the aspect of saying on the basis of um, court law and whatever versus whatever um, that there is the definitive. The very first thing that we'd want to say is where is the, where is the limit of, of the freedom of speech is as a Christian, the Eighth Commandment be, begins at all. Um, and the Eighth Commandment that tells me that the things that I speak and the things that I say, um, no matter if the government has given me the freedom to say it or not, if it is not something that is going to be a, a benefit to build up an individual's reputation, then I ought not say it. And there's a difference, of course, between um, tearing down someone's reputation and pointing out um, things that somebody does that you see as being detrimental and harmful for a nation or a country. Um, and it's, a lot of it is going to also have to do with the way in which we, we say it. Um, it's not always even just what we say, it's, it's how we say it. But I think there's also a, a misunderstanding, of course, in our society that just because I have the right to say it does not mean that there are not consequences for me saying it. And so you have an individual who works for a, a company, and they may very well have the right to say what they want to say on the basis of the First Amendment, but it does not mean that the company does not have the right to terminate their employment because it goes contrary to the stated agreement of that employer. So we, we have gotten into, and just by listening to the rhetoric that's on, on the TV and, and people being let go and these type of things, is that um, people have gotten to this point of thinking that just because I have a, a right to say whatever I want should mean that I, I shouldn't have to suffer any consequences for it. That isn't the case. Um, but anytime you're dealing with a sinful world, there's going to be sinful applications to, to things in this world as well. Um, because who determines at one point in time of what is wrongful rhetoric? Um, and what is punishable by a, a law to say something? You know, there have been times throughout history that to confess Christ publicly has been considered by the government a crime. Certainly it's not. Um, and so it's always coming back to God's word first for the Christian, um, regardless of what the government has laid down for me. First is um, the very first commandment. In, in the things that I, that I say, I want to be sure that I give glory to God um, and, and glory to him and him alone. If I am not allowed to do that in my government, I still do it because I must obey God rather than men. Um, and then it comes to the Eighth Commandment in the way I speak about others. And so even if I have the right to say it, and even if I have the right to say it without any consequences, if it's not in line with what God has to say in the Eighth Commandment, I don't have the right to say it as a Christian. Go ahead. Absolutely not. Um, we want to see it, from the non-Christian, um, we would love to see on the basis of, of what God, excuse me, on the basis of reason arguing what is right, we'd love to see the fact that um, a freedom is a freedom for everyone, but it just doesn't always happen. And, and I think I made that comment when we were, when we were going through um, the final chapters of of the book we just finished reading is, isn't it interesting, um, the lie 
that Satan has sold. So the lie that Satan has sold is there is no such thing as an absolute truth. That thought, that belief carried out should mean that there is world peace. It really should. Carried out, that thought should mean there's world peace. Because if there's no such thing as an absolute truth, which then carries the next statement is, well, what's good for you is good for you, and what's good for me is good for me, there should be no hostility. But of course, the, the lie that there is no such thing as absolute truth has actually created more hostility in the world than less. Because who's now determining what becomes the truth? Well, the sinful nature of mankind is in saying that anything that might contradict that then does become a lie. Turning our page. How can a two-party political system provide a challenge for the church in regard to keeping church and state separate? Rudy? Say it again. I say one party might, for their gain, might mutter up to the Christian faith for their gain. Okay. So on, on the aspect of, of the one party trying to use the church as a, as a tool? For themselves, for their power. Okay. Evan? So any, so any topic. So let me take, let me take your thought here and, and expand it out a little bit. Um, Considering one topic, a two political party system lends itself to what when it comes to that one topic? I wonder if I'm asking a very good question or a very clear question. And only two different sides. So if you have, let's just say, um, a political party system that maybe has a legitimate five individuals, and you have a one topic, and you have, you know, let's say three to four opinions on that one topic. In general, of course, not always the case, but in general, as heated in the discussions of four different views, or more heated when there's just the one view and the other view. In general, it becomes much more divisive when there's just two. And this kind of comes back to what we were talking about in the previous question. Um, when there's only a two political party system, it's really, really hard for Christians. And when I speak of Christians, I'm not talking about, you know, just in a general passing as they're in their houses and they're having conversations with others. But Christians within the church, um, really difficult not to let one bias come out and really permeate and just go all the way through. Um, and not that it's bad or wrong to have an opinion. But a two political party system makes it much more challenging 
to kind of just let it sit there and not be such a hot button topic in the church. And, and once again, here's where coming back to Jesus is so valuable. And that is remembering how he spoke to the two points and very specifically spoke to the one without trying to intermingle at the same time the other. Just give to Caesar what's Caesar's. Give to God what's God's. Um, and he divided the two. He didn't try to put the two of them together because if he did, he was going to run into the problems. Question nine. Agree or disagree? It is possible for two Christians to be members of two completely different mainline political parties. Is it too obvious or is it, I don't want to answer it? Rachel. It is agree. I'm pretty sure I've told you the, the, the story before of a, of a seasoned pastor who, who once told me the story that <clears throat> he had a, a member come to him and say, you and the elders need to go and um, excommunicate my neighbor because he has democratic signs on his front lawn. equaling that anybody who isn't one political party obviously is living in sin. So valuable for us to remember, what are we voting for when we vote for a leader in our government? We're voting for somebody we believe can lead our nation well. Um, and just take for example, you know, suppose somebody, candidate A, supports abortion, but is against homosexual marriage and is against legalizing not only marijuana but also cocaine and heroin and is also against continuing to fund the health and the insurance for those who want to alter their gender that we were born with. So you would say, I'm opposed to one of the things that they hold to, that they're for abortion, but I'm in favor of the other things that they are now you have candidate B, who is opposed to abortion. However, everything else that the previous one was opposed to, they are for. As you look at those, you realize neither of them are going to take God's word and want to let that be guiding the decisions that they make. And as I listen to candidate B, who is opposed to abortion, but is for everything else, I listen to someone who is really basically on their platform not only going to legalize these things, but has so clearly revealed that in their desire to put these into place, has given the demonstration that this is only the beginning and his hope is to, or her hope is to, even legalize more things that are contrary to God's word to the point of where people can just do whatever they want. Now, candidate A, who's for abortion but against all these other things, actually has a stance and gives qualities in which they appear to be actually a really good leader. In every other stop they've made, 
they've improved things. What happens if a Christian looks at that and says, I'm not in favor of either of them, but the reality is, even if this one goes into office who's against abortion, the chances right now, with the way the Senate are and the House are, that that's not changing. And I don't see them being a leader that's going to lead anything well. And now, they're also wanting to legalize all these other things. That is only a rolling stone down a hill getting faster and faster. But there's this other one that I think actually can lead our nation well. Totally for something that I'm against. But I vote for candidate A. And it's not the political party that I usually support. Has that Christian done anything wrong? No. Not in the least. And I think that we need to keep that in mind as we, as we have this rhetoric, as we speak on, on these things, as we hide sometimes behind computer screens and write whatever we want to write, is that we dare not become legalistic. We dare not make statements that God's word has not made. And we dare not judge the motive that an individual goes into that voting booth with, um, especially if they've claimed to be a Christian and everything else in which they have done has demonstrated that they believe in their Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that they're totally for everything God's word has to say, but they all of a sudden say, but when it comes to leading this nation, I think A is better than B. Um, and so we need, to, we need to be very careful in the way in which you carry out those things because um, the truth of the matter is we're not going to find a candidate that's perfectly in tune with God's word, at least not anytime soon. Um, you know, it's interesting. Even, even one individual who might even have a semblance of religion is just absolutely being raked through the coals right now for having a semblance of a religion. Um, makes you, makes you um, a little concerned, but at the same time, um, let's have that understanding that an individual can be a Christian and not always have the exact same political view that I have. Um, and if God's word is guiding and directing, um, what's going to lead an individual is, is God's word, at the same time recognizing there isn't ever or usually a perfect candidate. Um, closely connected to that, what happens if you have this... this um, Candidate A, candidate A, who's willing to compromise on abortion. Candidate B, who says there should be no, no limits. Now all of a sudden, sometimes we might find ourselves in a case of saying, well, I just don't know if I can vote for anybody. Um, but does sometimes it come to a point of saying, but is my non-vote a vote for the one that is even worse? in my mind, according to what God's word has to say. Um, once again, those things all come into play when it comes to our, our, our voting. Um, we're letting God's word direct us in the citizenship of this world, but we recognize we can't just say, hey, um, you don't follow God's word. What's wrong with you? It's not going to carry any weight um, as, we, as we go into the voting booths. Pastor, I had seen your hand going up at the beginning. No, I it, it, it's tough. It, it is tough. There's no doubt about it. Um, but I, I think that there's always, when we look at what God's word has to say, um, our goal is to serve God and to serve our neighbor. Um, and the reality of the matter is, is that the way in which that we serve our neighbor at times can be different. Yeah.
Absolutely. Question 10. Two examples are given below of how, throughout the years, the church made civil government its business. Consider the negative impact this had on, number one, the church, and number two, the world's perception of the church. So in AD 1096, the church promoted a number of crusades to rescue the Holy Land and sacred places from the Muslim Turks. The crusades were basically a call to war. The good news was that anyone who died while on a crusade didn't have to go to purgatory, and those who helped pay for supplies could get a special indulgence that would spare them from purgatory. And point two, today church-based organizations such as the Christian Coalition and the Rainbow Coalition argue in the political arena for political change based on the Bible, sometimes taking opposite positions on issues. Of course, each organization claims to speak for God. So, what's the impact on the church, and what's the impact on the world's perception of the church? Um, and so we can kind of have a comment for each of those paragraphs. Um, what's the impact on the church when we speak about that first paragraph? Rachel? Okay. Certainly can hurt the spread of the gospel. And are you speaking for both of them or just one specifically of the paragraphs? You can say both if you. Okay, both. Evan. So the gospel goes out the window, and, and notice, not only the, does the gospel go out the window, but in order to support political agendas, false doctrine is promoted. And the church goes to war. And if you think of the second one, the gospel goes out the window in an effort to simply change society. Rudy. Yeah, on that second one, the thing that popped into my mind was it's the devil's way of lessening the importance of the church in society. People tend to, quote, that's what it is, that's why it's far as it's kind of happening. And you kind of take us there into the second aspect of, of that question. What's the impact of the, um, on the world's perception of the church, right? Um, I, I don't necessarily want anything to do with them. And not only that, but, but you think about sometimes taking opposite positions on issues. So you have two individuals, or two entities, going at an issue, saying they're speaking for God from his word, and they have completely two opposite things. What type of perception does that give to the world about the word of God? People just manipulate it however they want to. Churches just manipulate it however they want to to fit their own ideas of what their theology is. It's not a surprise that in our witnessing to so many individuals, that so many individuals respond sometimes to what we say is the truth of God's word by saying, that's your interpretation. Should we really be surprised when the world is consistently and constantly seeing those that call themselves religious interpreting things simply to fit what they want it to? Consider the perception on the world. Um, when these things happen, when the, when the um, functions and the, the things that the Lord has given to the church and the state um, don't remain separate. Um, 
I'll, I'll just bring back not necessarily a, a case of, of um, the need to have a long, lengthy discussion concerning it, but I mentioned the name Father Altman last, last week. So what do you suppose the average individual in the world who watches the Catholic priest um, make a 10-minute video on um, a political stance and the things that are going on and there's no mention of Jesus? What do you suppose the world thinks the Catholic Church is really concerned about? Not Jesus and the, and the cross and, and not um, faith and, and not forgiveness of sins. And so you stop and consider the perception the world will get when the church strives to enter into the area of the state when it ought not be doing so. Do I see a question coming or a thought? Turning the page. Let's listen to Paul's wonderful advice, but even more so, um, our Lord's marvelous direction to us when it comes to these sometimes difficult things. First of all, then, I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all those who are in authority, in order that we might live a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and pleasing in the sight of God and our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. For this testimony, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I speak the truth. I am not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. So Paul urges us to pray for those who are ruling over us He said this, even though the Roman government was evil and anti-Christian, what should we ask for in our prayers for the government? Penny. Absolutely a good thing that they be upright and just. Rudy. Rudy. Nothing wrong with praying that. Lord, lead them to see their error. Lead them to that humility that would lead them to change once they see that error. Pastor. Yeah. Um, When you consider that coupled there in in the um, passage that that Paul writes to Timothy, um, this is a good God wants all people to be saved. We recognize that the the goal and the prayer is, is that our government would be good in order that the gospel can continue to be spread and not hindered. Anything else that we could pray for? Certainly those thoughts that were given can be spread out and, and cover many areas. Um, probably pray that, that they be fair and just too, Right? that they would make use of a common sense judgment and morality. You know, not only does the Lord come to us telling us to, to pray for the government, and I'll, I'm, not, I'm not equating government with an enemy, but isn't it also, he talks about loving our enemies and praying for our enemies. Not only is it a case of where he teaches us to, us to do that, um, because it's what he wants us to do. But there's a whole lot of wisdom in his command in the sense that, do you realize how difficult it is to remain angry and speak evil about someone that you're praying 
good for? Um, it's a whole lot more difficult. Jeff. Yeah, that's a good point, too. Um, remaining humble and leading them to remember that they are representatives of the individuals who have elected them. Yeah. That the way in which we have been set up as a government, that they are elected in order to do what's good for the people. Rudy. Rudy. Yeah, and not only would there have been, and we make the assumption, and rightfully so, that there were, um, I just, again and again, go back to the section in the book of Acts when um, the, the apostles had been arrested, when they had been told, you know, don't preach, when they had been beaten, and they go and gather with the rest of their apostles and read their prayer, has nothing to do with, Lord, topple this government. Lord, remove them and strike them with judgment and justice. Rather, it's, Lord, make us bold to share your gospel. Um, what a beautiful example um, left for us. Did I see, Pastor, your hand going up? No? Okay. Um, Pastor kind of touched on question 12, though, already. I mean, that aspect of how does a stable government aid in the protection, excuse me, the proclamation of the gospel? Um, certainly that freedom of worship, right? Um, the opportunity that we can still walk up and down a street and we can, you know, hand out a flyer to invite somebody to church. Um, the opportunity to knock on a door, the opportunity in, in a store, you see somebody crying to, to go up to them and say, what's wrong? And, and, and in the process of them actually saying, somebody's listening to me and they pour out their entire life to you and you sit there and you listen. I don't even know this person. I can't believe they're telling me all of this. And then you have opportunity to share the word of God. Um, you know, that freedom of religion gives us the opportunity to do that again and again. Um, you think about, um, it was brought up a number of lessons back of, of, you know, the stable government of Rome, which produced the road system, enabled Paul to be able to go throughout the nation. And, and think about our own country, how much easier it is to do mission work here. And, and I can kind of look at pastor, and perhaps in some ways easier to do mission work here than in those areas where you can't travel very well. Um, it's hard to get from place to place. You, you think about the, the early missionaries who went to Africa, and you, you read the books, you read the stories, you see the stories of, you know, they're in one place, and then they had to spend you know, three days to get to another place, and they weren't back to that place again for you know, maybe a month. And actually, the early parts of our own, our own nation, um, they had what were called the rice predators, you know, the, the ones that were circuit, you know, not, not circuit pastors in the way we think of circuit pastors, but there were these circuits that they hopped on their horse and they went here and they, they served there for a while and they went there and they served there for a while. Um, you know, just think about it though. You know, you come back to this place they started from, you don't get there again until a month or two later. Um, this ministry that isn't able to be carried out. Um, lots of blessings in, in the government in that regard as well. Let's look at, um, let's stop, actually. Um, we are right at our, our time, I believe, and so that this doesn't, timer doesn't go off in the middle of our prayer. We will close with prayer, unless there's a question or comment. We close with prayer. Heavenly Father, by your grace we have been blessed with life under a government that has allowed us to freely proclaim and live our Christian life. Yet we also recognize that the government, as a secular institution, 
has great potential to exercise an ungodly influence on your people. Protect us from such an influence. Help us to recognize the dangers of the church becoming dependent on or obligated to the government in spiritual matters. Make us even more committed to the truth of your word and to faithfully preaching and teaching it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.